Buy that pastel, girls. It's the last one. The rest sold like hotcakes. Alice's face showed keen disappointment. This isn't your work. The woman chuckled and sat down heavily. That's right, dearie. I can't even draw a cow. I'm a dealer. I buy from the artists and sell their work. Where's the man who did this picture? Nancy pressed. That I don't know. He told me he was a stranger, just visiting Phoenix. Seemed kind of closed mouth. Didn't say where he came from and where he was staying. Alice asked, was he a slender, gray-haired man? Yes, said his name was Bercy. Do you know him? We think so, Nancy replied. Alice looked longingly at the picture. How much is it? She asked the woman. When Alice heard the price, her face clouded. I haven't enough money to buy it. Exchanging quick glances, the other girls reached an agreement. That's all right, Alice, said Nancy. We'll make up the difference. When the picture was paid for, Alice took it gratefully. She thanked the girls as they walked away from the dealer, then added, Oh, Nancy, you've been so wonderful to me. Alice's eyes were misty with emotion. I feel we must be getting closer to my father. She thought that he might have returned to the mountain cabin and begged Nancy to go back there with her. I wish I could, said Nancy, but it would be too late to make the trip today after we reach the ranch. Tell you what, though, I'll take you in the morning. George had another idea. There's just a chance our Uncle Ross Reger might be around the exhibi exhibition someplace. He might have come to see how his pictures are selling. The others agreed that George had a point. And for a while, the four girls strolled through the park, keeping their eyes open for the slender, gray-haired man. They did not see him. <clears throat> Near mid-afternoon, Nancy treated everyone to cool sodas from a passing vendor, and they sat on the bench to drink them. Bess glanced at her watch and suggested they start for home. George drove. They crossed the desert without trouble and arrived at the ranch in time for supper. At the table, they learned that the telephone, lights, and water had been restored, but four of the Palominos were still missing. The critters are up on Shadow Mountain somewhere, Bud remarked gloomily as he passed the biscuits to Nancy. We have our work cut out to track them. We might as well face it, said Uncle Ed. They might be badly hurt. To lighten the conversation, Aunt Bet reminded everyone of the barbecue next, the next day. It's customary for us ranch folks to take a dessert. Any suggestions? Tex grinned. I sure do cotton to chocolate cake. Nancy makes scrumptious ones, said Bess. Well, then I guess she's elected, Mrs. Raleigh said with a smile. Nancy laughed. Thank you for the job, my friends. Now who's going to help? I will, chorused Dave, Tex, and Bud. Good, said Nancy. You boys can shell the walnuts for topping the icing. That is, if you have any, Mrs. Thurmond. We've got plenty of everything, the cook declared. Just step right up and take hold. We'll all help, Bess said happily. Let's make it an extra big cake. After supper, the girls dried the dishes for Mrs. Thurmond. Then Nancy put all the cake ingredients on the big kitchen table. The cook gave her several large bowls. Tex grinned as he picked up a nutcracker. Boys, we hired out to punch cows and here we are peeling nuts. While Nancy and her assistants worked, they talked about the phantom. Mrs. Thurmond listened intently. Where do you think the ghost horse is kept? Alice asked. Folks say Valentine had a hideout on Shadow Mountain. Mrs. Thurman spoke up, and I figure that's where the critter stays now, same as it did in life. The girls tried to convince the cook that the apparition was a mere trick, but they could not do it. Nancy changed the subject. If Valentine did have a hideout in this area, very likely he kept his horse in a corral there. It's possible that the persons who are attacking the ranch have discovered the place and are using it for their trick horse. Mrs. Thurman shook her head gloomily. If it was real folks doing the damage, I'd face right up to them, she declared. But I've seen that spook with my own eyes. I tell you, it's too much for my nerves. By the time the baking was finished, Mrs. Thurman had excused herself and gone to bed. Now for the icing, said Nancy. When the cake was cool enough, she covered it with thick, creamy swirls of dark chocolate and studded the top with whole walnuts. Bess sighed. It's too bad we can't have just a teeny piece now, isn't it? I sure could go for a slab, Tex agreed hungrily. Come on, Cookie, Dave t coaxed Nancy. <laughs> Think about how good that would taste to us poor riders out on the midnight watch, Bud said in his soft drawl. Saddle sore, weary. You're breaking our hearts, George said cheerfully. Graham crackers and milk tonight, 
Nancy announced with a chuckle. You'll get your cake tomorrow. In the morning, Alice could hardly contain her excitement over the trip to the cabin. Not wanting their destination known, Nancy had warned Alice to say nothing of her hopes at the breakfast table. When Aunt Bet asked the girls about their plans, Nancy said, Alice and I would like to go for a ride in the mountains. George had letters to write, and Bess said she wanted to wash and set her hair. I'll saddle up for you, Shorty volunteered. Nancy was surprised at his friendly gesture. She and Alice thanked him, then hurried to change into riding clothes. When they were dressed and waiting on the portico, Tex walked by, leading Nancy's bay. Just behind him came Shorty with a sorrel for Alice. Nancy stepped into the yard and mounted easily. With a shrill whinny, the horse reared. Hang on, Tex shouted. Nancy gripped the pommel tight and hung onto the reins. The horse pitched high and landed stiff-legged on all fours. Nancy seized the bridle and held the bay down, giving time to Nancy to fling herself from the saddle. Easy, boy. Easy now, Tex said as he tried to calm the excited animal. Nancy, are you hurt? Alice asked worriedly. I'm all right, Nancy replied breath breathlessly. But what's the matter with the horse? Shorty had hurried to Tex's assistance, and now the snorting steed was standing still. The red-haired cowboy's eyes narrowed with suspicion as he loosened the saddle girth and reached up under the blanket. I thought so. He brought out his hand and held it open for the others to see. In his palm lay a nettle. Shorty's eyes grew wide. Well, what do you know about that? He drawled. Tex looked at him levelly. What do you know about this? Me? exclaimed Shorty. Some mean coyote pulled that trick, not me. You saddled the animals. Tex retorted and turned to Nancy. I was passing the stable when Shorty came out with these mounts. He asked me to bring this one over to you. Now hold on there a minute, Shorty put in. When I went to the stable after breakfast, I found this bay already saddled. I throwed the saddle on the other one and brung him out. That's all I know about it. You got no call to accuse me. No, sir, not me. Tex's face flushed with anger. If you're telling me the truth, Shorty Steele, I apologize. Before the stocky cowboy could answer, Nancy suggested that Tex check Alice's sal saddle blanket. He did and reported that it was all right. <clears throat> the girls mounted and rode toward the meadow. I don't believe Shorty was telling the truth, said Alice. Nancy said nothing, but she was inclined to agree. Aloud, she said, someone's not given up trying to get me out of the picture. When they finally sighted the cabin, Nancy reined up behind the clump of big boulders. She swung from the saddle and ground hitched her horse, but was not so quick as Alice. The younger girl dashed up to the cabin and knocked on the door. As Nancy ran up, it was opened by a slender gray-haired man. With a shock, Nancy recognized him. He was the one who'd put the snake's rattle into her knitting bag and had dropped the warning note into the car. It's the end of chapter 14. <clears throat> Catch up. You have a sore throat. That was me all last weekend. <laughs> Music's all right? Okay, cool. You have the flu. Oh, I'm sorry. Everybody get well. Stay healthy. I know it's the time of year where it's really hard to kind of, you know stay perfectly healthy all the time but take your vitamins drink your oj wash your hands a lot i'm glad you're not fevered anymore hi timo me too Paige. i want to play this game now let's just all play shadow ranch come on cookie come on bob um is any, was anybody else slightly weirded out by the fact that Dave called Nancy Cookie? <laughs> then again, Nancy did agree to literally go on a date with Dave in the book. And both Bess and George were like, what about Ned? Like, <clears throat> yike. Big yike. Just make two cakes, no problem. <laughs> That's what my mom does. What about Aunt Pam? <laughs> Whoa, suspenseful. Uh, Jay Gelvar is Jake. Oh, I'm not done yet, Ula. I, that was just the end of the chapter. Yeah, Jake is more, most, more so a lurker. He does pop in occasionally. Don't shake hands, yeah. 
Cookie is an odd nickname. Ned and Cookie, like Ned's the Classified School Survivor Guide. Aunt Pam can make as many cakes as you want. I'll take seven. <clears throat> All right, let's move along. We have six more chapters, so we might as well keep them coming. Chapter 15, A Perilous Ride. Alice was on the verge of tears. The man in the cabin doorway was not her father. He scowled at the two girls. What do you want? Nancy was sure the man must have recognized her, but he gave no sign of it, so she pretended not to know him. Quickly, she thought of an excuse for coming. Are you Mr. Bercy? she asked. Yes, why? We'd like to buy one of your pastels, Nancy replied. My what? Pastels? Your pictures? Nancy said. Oh, the man paused. I haven't any more. How did you know I was here? Nancy explained casually that Mary Deer had told him the artist lived told them the artist lived on the mountain. Several days ago we happened to see this cabin and we thought perhaps it might be where you live. He gave Nancy a long hard look. My paintings are all gone, he said, no use coming back. Nancy apologized for bothering him, and as the girls turned to walk back to their horses, he closed the door. Alice was deeply upset. I just can't believe that man drew those pictures. I'm sure he didn't, Nancy replied as the girls mounted. He's no artist. He didn't know what I meant by pastels, and he called the pictures paintings. He should have known their drawings, made with special crayons. She told Alice how she, Bess, and George had encountered that man before. Alice was excited. Maybe he's holding my father prisoner somewhere? Nancy agreed that was possible, but where, she wondered. There had been no one else in the one-room cabin. Recalling how Chief had appeared mysteriously from behind it, Nancy surmised there was a hiding place nearby. What shall we do, Nancy? Alice asked. Report to the sheriff as fast as we can. Nancy added that if Alice's father was a prisoner of Bercy, the gray-haired man and his pals might very well be the bank sh Chicago bank robbers. <clears throat> and since Bercy is also mixed up with the ranch trouble, his gang is probably responsible for the phantom horse. As the girls rode down the trail, Nancy's thoughts dwelt uneasily on the man who said his name was Bercy. Could he possibly believe that she had not known him? I'm afraid my, my trumped-up story didn't fool him, she decided. He must know I'll report him to Sheriff Curtis, but why didn't he try to stop me? The answer was plain. The man believed that people did- The man believed that people knew the girl's destination. He doesn't want us to disappear at his cabin. Nancy told herself, so he'll arrange an accident for us on the way down the mountain. She turned in her saddle and warned Alice to keep alert for signs of pursuit. A little farther along, they came to a fork in the trail. Let's follow this other path, Nancy suggested. They soon found the new route a hazardous one, however, and were forced to slow down. The horses were picking their footing on the narrow trail, which wound back and forth across a sheer cliff. Alice glanced up. Uncle Ed says that Westerners call this kind of path an eyebrow trail. I can see why. A few minutes later, the girls rode under a rock overhang which prevented them from seeing the turn of the path above them. Suddenly, pebbles and dust started falling from above. Someone was following them. Nancy signaled to Alice, who nodded her understanding. The riders sat in tense silence as their horses slowly proceeded to the bottom of the cliff where the trail became less steep, but it was narrow and precarious. The girls urged their horses to go as fast as they dared. Soon they heard the clatter of a horse's hooves behind them. Nancy knew they had no defense against the surprise attack she feared was coming. It would only take a few boulders rolling from above to spook the horses and cause an accident. Nancy looked ahead for shelter. Some distance below, the trail disappeared among high rocks. If we can reach that spot before our enemy strikes, she thought, we may have a chance. Again, the girls urged their mounts on and rode desperately toward the screen of rocks. Jolting hard, Alice clung to the saddle horn all the way. We made it, she gasped as they rounded a curve and were hidden between the huge boulders which lay on either side. Swiftly, Nancy dismounted, signaling her companion to do the same. The younger girl followed as Nancy led her horse into a cluster of the giant rocks. Alice held her mount firmly and kept one hand soothingly upon his nose. If only the animals would stand quietly. One jangle of the bridle or a hoof scuffing a stone and their hiding place would be revealed. Hardly breathing, the girls heard the clatter of stones as their pursuer approached. The sounds came closer, then suddenly stopped. He sees we're not on the trail ahead, Nancy thought. Would the rider figure 
that they had rounded the next curve but were hiding? For a long moment, there was silence from the other side of the boulders. He's listening, Nancy thought. The girls stood frozen. Then came the creak of a saddle and the sound of hooves as the rider moved on. Nancy and Alice gave sighs of relief and after waiting a few minutes, led their horses out of the boulders. Quickly, the two remounted. Alice said fearfully, when he reaches open mountainside again, he'll see he's missed us and come back. We'll meet him head on. I know, Nancy replied. We have to look for another branching tr trail. Presently, she spotted a side path among the boulders and the girls guided their horses onto it. The way downward was narrow and rough, but the two riders were sheltered first by rocks, then tall fir and tamarack trees. They reached the valley a mile from where the other trail came down. We made it safely, Alice cried in relief. Oh, Nancy, how can I ever thank you? Her companion smiled. Don't think I wasn't scared myself. It was noon when the girls dismounted at the stable. They hurried to the living room where they found the Raleighs chatting with Bess and George. While Alice excitedly reported all that had happened to them, Nancy telephoned the sheriff. She told him her suspicions of the man calling himself Bercy and also the possibility that Ross Rager, Alice's father, was being held prisoner on the mountain by the same gang responsible for the phantom horse trick. Sheriff Curtis said, I'll go up to the cabin at once with two men and arrest this hombre, Bercy, and his confederates. Nancy hastened back to the living room and reported the conversation. That's great, exclaimed George. If the sheriff catches the bank robbers, it'll mean the end of the damage on the ranch. But they must have another hideout where they keep Uncle Ross, Bess objected, and we don't know where that is. Besides, the sheriff may find only Bercy. But if he talks, we'll get to the bottom of the mystery. Nancy reminded her. Suddenly, the door to the portico burst open and Dave came in. Mr. Raleigh, we found the missing horses. Amid the girl's exclamation of joy, the rancher beamed and asked, Where are they? Tex, Bud, and I put them in the meadow. We found them up on Shadow Mountain, grazing by a creek. Dave hesitated. The only thing is, they are hurt. Mr. Raleigh's jaw tightened. Bad? Three of them are wire cut and the mare is limping. We better call the vet. The rancher agreed, and Dave hurried to the telephone. Could be worse, Uncle Ed said. Maybe everything will be all right, provided there's no more damage. Aunt Bet smiled cheerfully. Nothing more is likely to happen. After all, the sheriff is on his way to round up the gang, thanks to Nancy. In a happy frame of mind, the girls hurried away to dress in their squaw outfits before lunch. While she showered, Nancy's thoughts were on the treasure. Where could the outlaw have hidden it? Still puzzling, Nancy slipped into her blue costume. She brushed her Titian hair until it gleamed and then put on a pair of small silver earrings and added a touch of lipstick. The other girls were not ready yet, so Nancy went into the living room to wait for them. As she seated herself in one of the rockers, her glance fell on the fireplace. Once again, the Indian grinding stone caught her attention. She recalled what Aunt Bet had told her about it and about the other stones. Suddenly, her eyes lit up with an idea and she jumped forward in excitement. Bess, George, Alice, she called, running to the door. "'What is it?' asked George as the three girls came hurrying down the hall. Nancy's eyes sparkled with excitement. "'I think I know where the treasure is.'" End of chapter 15. <clears throat> "'This cookie don't crumble?' "'Ooh, English breakfast tea. "'Exciting.'" "'Ginger ale's also yum.'" And Powerade, gotta get them electrolytes for show. Hey, Arox. And he hello, how are you? Sh what should I call you? Should I call you, uh, Morta? If there's something else you'd prefer me to call you, let me know. Yes, I do post these to YouTube. This is very true. Um, all of my book streams are on YouTube. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Arox, but I completely understand. I had a day similar to that myself. Treasure. How many pages is one Nancy Drew book? Morta? Should I call you that? Morty? This one is 175 pages. They're usually between 160 and 190 pages. Um, typically. I have 30 minutes left at work and I'm ready to fall asleep in my chair. 
Rotus? Do you want me to call you that? Rotus? I, I mean, you'll have to be a little more clear than, like, using a emoji because I'm too dense to, to know what's going on. <clears throat> uh, yeah, but they are definitely shorter than a series of unfortunate events. Um, the last series of unfortunate events book is... I have it right here. Let's see how many pages this is. Oh my. About 350 pages for the last book. So Nancy Drew books are definitely shorter. Thank you, A-Rox. I appreciate it. Okay. <clears throat> Let's keep it going. I'm trying to read one book per week for my New Year's resolution. Some of these books be too long for me to read. I understand that completely. But that's a great resolution. Okay. Chapter 16. The Sheriff's Quarry. A burst of excited questions met Nancy's announcement. She chuckled and George said, Quiet, everybody. Now tell us where the treasure is. Nancy led her friends into the living room, shut the door, and announced, In the cliff houses down the valley. They're certainly the oldest dwellings around here, said George, but they're not on the ranch. They were when Valentine wrote his letter. Nancy, how do you know that? Alice asked. Because Aunt Bet told us that every stone in this fireplace came from somewhere on the ranch. It stands to reason that the Indian grinding stone came from the cliff dwelling. She reminded the girls that Sheriff Humber had been obliged to sell that part of his property after Valentine's death. It's natural that he would get rid of the outlying section first. Nancy, declared George, that's a great piece of deduction. Just then the triangle clanged for luncheon. As the girls hurried to the kitchen, Nancy requested them to keep her theory a secret. We won't be able to check it before tomorrow, and we don't want anyone else to get there before us. As the group hurried into the kitchen, they stared in amazement. Mrs. Thurmond, ladling out stew at the stove, was wearing her big white apron as usual, and on her head was perched a black straw hat bedecked with artificial roses. Instead of being amused, the cowboy stood about looking uncomfortable, and Aunt Bet's face was strained. "'I'm leaving,' announced the cook without turning from her work. "'I fixed my last dinner in this place!' As soon as it's over, I'm riding into Tumbleweed with you young folks and taking the three o'clock bus for Phoenix. Mr. Raleigh said soothingly, Things have been pretty rough around here, Mrs. Thurman, but we think that they'll be getting better pretty soon. Mrs. Thurman faced the rancher squarely. Mr. Raleigh, I can take rough times with the best of them, but phantom horses? That's too much for me. She picked up a the big bowl of stew and walked toward the table. Aunt Bet followed her pleading. Mrs. Thurmond, please reconsider. Nope, said the woman and set the bowl down with a thump. Nancy knew that the loss of the cook would be an added hardship for Aunt Bet, who not only had ranch house duties but was needed to help her husband. This new crisis threw a pall over the meal. At the appearance of, the, of a magnificent lemon meringue pie, the gloom became even deeper for it seemed likely to be the last time any of the diners would taste Mrs. Thurmond's fine baking. When the dessert was gone, the men pushed their, back their chairs and rose. Immediately, the cook asked Dave what time he'd be driving the ranch wagon to Tumbleweed. Before he could answer, Nancy spoke up. Not for half an hour yet, are you, Dave? He caught the urgent message in her eyes and nodded. I'll honk the horn when I'm ready to go, he promised. As soon as the men had left the kitchen, the girls and Aunt Bet gathered around Mrs. Thurman and pleaded with her to remain. The little woman shook her head regretfully, but sad steadfastly refused. That phantom has me scared out of my skin, she declared. If I could prove to you that the Phantom is a real horse, Mrs. Thurmond, Nancy asked, would you stay? Of course I would. I'm not afraid of a live critter. Then let me just have a little time. I feel sure I'll be able to show you how that trick is done. The others chimed in, cajoling the cook to give Nancy a chance. Bess added, <clears throat> I don't know how we'll get along without you and all those wonderful pies. Mrs. Thurmond considered a moment. All right. One more night. At their delighted thanks, she flushed with pleasure and marched off to remove her hat. When she returned, the girls and Aunt Bet helped her clear the table. Before long, the horn of the ranch wagon sounded and Nancy left with her friends. Dave, Tex, and Bud were in the yard talking to Uncle Ed. Bud was holding a guitar in a case. 
A short distance away, Shorty lounged against the horse trailer, which had been hitched to the back of the ranch wagon. As the girls came up, they heard Uncle Ed say, You go ahead, boys, and have a good time. You've earned a holiday. You might need help with those palominos when the vet comes, said Dave. He glanced uneasily at Nancy, and she understood at once how he felt. I'll be glad to excuse you, Dave, if you feel you need to stay, she said. No, that's not necessary, Ed Raleigh said. As Dave thanked him, Nancy noticed Tex talking quietly to Alice. Flushed with excitement, she smiled happily and hurried to Nancy's side. Tex's brother Jack is going to be in the rodeo, and Tex says Jack would like to take me to the barbecue and dance. He's 15. Jack, I mean. Is that all right, Uncle Ed? She asked, blush blushing. The rancher nodded and chuckled. I've met the young man. Go ahead. As Alice went back to tell Tex, Nancy and George looked knowingly at Bess, who dimpled. Now how did you fix that, Miss Cupid? Her cousin asked. It was easy, Bess replied. I remembered Tex had mentioned his brother was coming into Tumbleweed, Tumbleweed for the rodeo. Come on, called Tex. Let's roll. The others hastened to the ranch wagon. <clears throat> Bud, carrying his guitar, climbed in the back of the wagon and Shorty joined him. Tex, George, and Bess sat in the middle, while Nancy and Alice took seats next to Dave, who was at the wheel. I've never been to a rodeo, Alice said as they started out. What's it like? Tex grinned. Well, Dave here's gonna flip some fancy loops, and so's Bud. He means they're gonna rope cows, said Bess. Steers, Tex corrected. Bess asked Tex what he was going to do. Dog a steer, was his reply. Dave chuckled at Alice's puzzled look. He'll ride his horse alongside a running steer and leap aboard. Then he'll bite the dust, Bud teased. Not Tex, Dave rejoined. He's a real salty bulldogger. And Shorty, there's a bronco buster, Tex added. And I'm fixing a win, too, Shorty declared. Wouldn't be the first time. He went on to brag about several occasions when he'd won prizes in rodeos. While he talked, Nancy was quiet, thinking hard about the phantom horse. Oh, how I wish Chief could talk, she said to herself. He's been closer to it than anyone. She wondered again why the dog had been held prisoner. Suddenly, Nancy thought of the light she had seen in the spring house shortly before the ghost horse had appeared. With a thrill of excitement, Nancy suddenly figured out how that trick could have been done. It was all she could do to keep from exclaiming aloud. She decided to say nothing to the other girls until she had an opportunity to prove her theory. I can't do that until after dark, she thought. When they reached Tumbleweed, Dave drove slowly through the streets crowded with visitors. Many of the men had on fringed buckskin jackets, and some of the women wore long pioneer dresses with sunbonnets. Others wore graceful squaw dresses. Suddenly, Nancy spotted a drably, drably dressed, gray-haired man standing in the doorway of a store, the man who called himself Bercy. At that moment, his eyes met hers, and he darted away into the crowd. Nancy's heart sank. The sheriff who was on his way to or from the cabin had missed his quarry. Nancy wondered what to do. Get word to the authorities? Dave interrupted her thoughts by saying that the rodeo would not start for an hour. We have to go and check in, he said. What do you girls want to do in the meantime? Oh, we'll keep busy, Nancy replied. When the cowboys had left, she suggested that Bess take Alice and hunt for Bercy. She and George would go in another direction. Let's meet at Mary Deer's shop. They all arrived half an hour later. There'd been no trace of the man. He probably left town in a hurry, George declared. The store was crowded and Mary Deer had an assistant working behind the counter. While the other girls looked at jewelry, Nancy beckoned her Indian friend aside and asked if she would keep a secret. When Mary promised, Nancy told her that she hoped to find the treasure in the cliff dwellings and inquired the best way to get to them. There are stairs up the front, said Mary, but they are not safe. You'd best come down from above. She explained that at the far end of the cliff apartments, there was a huge slab of rock which had been used as a lookout point by the ancient Indians. Stairs led from the rock down to the top row of dwellings. Nancy thanked Mary and promised to let her know if she discovered anything. By this time, the other girls had, brought, had bought Indian jewelry, and after Nancy had purchased a turquoise pillbox for Hannah, they left the shop. The foursome followed the arrows to the far end of town where they found the rodeo arena, a short distance from the stockyard. Nancy bought tickets at the front gate, and they all found seats in the stands. Bess sighed. Oh, so hot. I'd like to have a cold drink, and I think I need a hot dog to go with that. George grinned. Eating is really a very fattening hobby, dear cousin. Before Bess could retort, a, a voice came from the loudspeaker. Telephone call for Miss Nancy Drew in the booth next to the refreshment stand. 
The girls looked at one another in amazement. The girls looked afraid that something had gone wrong at the ranch, Nancy excused herself and hurried off. She made her way through the crowd to the first telephone booth beside the hot dog stand. As she reached it, the door opened and Bercy stepped out with a grin. At the same moment, a tall figure in black glided to her side, Mr. Diamond. Bercy's strong fingers closed on Nancy's wrist. You're coming with us, he growled, and don't yell or you'll be sorry. End of chapter 16. <clears throat> Yeah, there are more than enough Nancy Drew books to cover 48 books in a year. Hey, Heartless Shroom. There, yeah, there's like a lot. <laughs> We'll keep busy in the meantime. It's funny that if you ask Google how many Nancy Drew books there are, its first response is, at least four. <laughs> Who's the stronger protagonist, Nancy Drew or Scooby Drew? Do. Can you imagine if they did a crossover, Nancy Drew and Scooby Doo? Not Mr. Diamond! <clears throat> Hello, Bubbles222. We have four more chapters, I believe. 17, 18, 19. Yep, just four more chapters. They're about eight to ten pages each. Each chapter. Has not sure Scooby Doo's ever solved a case by himself. Ooh, got him. Nice to make your acquaintance, Bubbles. I hope you have a great day. <clears throat> and I hope you're having a, a wonderful Friday so far. It's Friday, right? Yeah, Friday. <laughs> okay. I try not, am I reading too fast? Like, am I reading so fast that you guys can't keep up? I don't want to be reading too fast. Zoinks! That's because nobody wants to be Nancy Drew's friend. She has friends! Bess and George are her friends! Hardy Boy's friends! Friends! She has those. It seems like a good pace to me. Okay. Faster! Okay. And I don't have for about to say anything to do with the voice. Okay, done. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, I'll keep going at this pace. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry you're tired. Sold! To the lady in the back! Okay. Alright, moving along. Chapter 17 An Interrupted Program. Before Nancy could say anything to the two men, Bess's voice rang out. She is not going with you. Let her go, George ordered. As Bercy whirled in surprise, Nancy jerked her wrist from his grasp. Diamond's startled look changed to a scowl, and the two men ran away fast, disappearing under the grandstand. Girls, you were wonderful, Nancy exclaimed, recovering from her shock. But those men must be caught. The three friends dashed after the fugitives, all the while looking for a deputy, but saw none. Finally, they gave up the chase. The two men had vanished. I'll go to the sheriff's office and report this, Nancy said. Not alone, George declared. We're sticking close to you for the rest of the afternoon. It's a good thing I let Bess talk me into coming down for a hot dog. Bess thought she'd better go back to Alice, who was holding their seats in the grandstand. George accompanied Nancy to Sheriff Curtis's office, where the young sleuth left a note for the absent lawman about the kidnapping attempt. When they returned to the rodeo arena, they heard a burst of cheering. Dave just won the roping contest, cried Alice as Nancy and George took their seats. The delighted girls clapped loudly. <clears throat> Bud was good, too, Bess put in loyally as Dave walked to the judges' stand. Modestly, he accepted the first prize, a pair of silver spurs, and left the arena to another burst of, of applause. Next came the Bronco Busters. The girls watched, thrilled, as one after another of the contestants hurtled into the arena on the bucking horses. Shorty came last. Shrill whistles filled the air as he tried to stick in the saddle for the required number of minutes. Look at him, sunfish! Came a shout from the stands as the frantic horse pitched high into the air, his back arched. Suddenly a shot rang out from the judge's stand. Time's up! Shorty's won! George exclaimed. The stands erupted into cheers. At the same time, the Bronx shook his rider loose. The winner rolled over in the dust, picked himself up, retrieved his hat, and waved it at the spectators. As the Bronx was shunted out of the arena by attendants, Shorty strode to the judge's stand. He claimed his prize, a silver buckle, and held it up for all to see. 
Then he swaggered out of the arena. After the rodeo, the girls met their dates outside the front gate. Tex introduced his brother Jack, a tall, freckle-faced boy, whose friendly manner put immediately put Alice at ease. Quickly, Nancy warned the boys about Bercy and Diamond. Dave looked worried, and Jack spoke up. I don't know what all this is about, but no one will get to Al get Alice away from me till I turn her over to Nancy after the dance. Nancy and Dave led the way to the ranch wagon. Shorty said he'd come along later, he remarked. On the drive to the barbecue grounds, Nancy quietly told him her deduction about the treasure. Dave was excited and said he hoped she was right. About a mile beyond Tumbleweed, he parked in a grove of willow trees be beside a narrow stream. The grounds were set with many long wooden tables and benches, and overhead were strings of small electric lights. Come on, gals, said Tex. We're gonna put on a big feed. He led them toward a long serving table. Four men passed by, each carrying a shovel bearing a big burlap-wrapped package. These were dumped onto the table. There goes the meat, said Bud. It's been buried in the barbecue pit since last night. Cooking nice and slow over hot stones, Tex added. When the burlap fell away, the fragrance of the steaming meat was irresistible. All the girls enjoyed generous servings with a spicy relish and potato salad. By the time they had finished their desserts of ice cream and Nancy's chocolate cake, the colored lights overhead came on. <clears throat> a stout, middle-aged man mounted the dance platform in the center of the grove and announced that he was the master of ceremonies. Seeing Bud's guitar, he called on him for some cowboy songs. Bud played I'm a Lonesome Cowboy, and everyone joined in enthusiastically. He followed with a number of other old favorites. Finally, he strummed some Gold Rush songs, including Sweet Betsy from the Pike. The cheers and applause had not yet died down when Shorty stepped onto the platform. Ignoring the Master of Ceremonies, he leaned toward the microphone and said, Folks, how'd you like me to do my imitations? At the scattered hand clapping and whistles, the stout man nodded and stepped back. Shorty cupped his hands into his mouth, closed his eyes, and the long, mournful hoot of an owl filled the night. He's really good, Bess whispered. I bet he could also do a whining dog, Nancy said meaningfully. Next, the cowboy announced a, coyo a coyote and produced several realistic howls. Suddenly, in mid-howl, he spotted Nancy in the audience. His jaw dropped and he stood sil silent before the microphone. Staring at her, he stammered that his act was over and left the platform. The girls exchanged baffled glances. Dave grinned. That was one surprised coyote, all right. He thought his pals had got rid of you, Nancy. Just then, a band of three musicians began tuning up and a square dancing contest was announced. Alice suggested that the four couples enter as a set and the others agreed enthusiastically. Of the four groups in the contest, Nancy's was called first. The young people lined up on the platform facing each other in couples. At the sound of the lively music, they began to dance. The fiddle player called the steps and played his tunes fast. Swing your partners in a do -si do Whirling past the edge of the platform, Nancy glimpsed Shorty glowering at her. When the breathless dancers returned to their table, Nancy told the others of the incident. It's going to be hard to shake Shorty from now on. I'm afraid he and his pals will watch us so closely we'll have no chance to go after the treasure. While the other sets of dancers competed, Nancy pondered on how to make sure the girls were not followed to the cliff houses. At the end of the contest, the crowd voted by, by applause and the Shadow Ranch group won easily. Nancy was sent to the platform to claim the prize. The Master of Ceremonies handed her a pink slip of paper. You take this to the food table over yonder, young lady, and they will give you and your friends a big ice-cold watermelon. Nancy thanked the man and then turned to the audience and said, I'd like to make an announcement that I believe will interest everybody in this area. My friends and I think we know where the famous long-lost Valentine treasure is hidden. An excited rustle ran through the crowd in cries of, Where? Nancy smiled. I won't say anything more about it now, but tomorrow a few Shadow Ranch men are going out to do some digging. As Nancy hurried from the platform, she saw Sheriff Curtis making his way toward her. He spoke of his futile search on the mountains and his regret that the Desperados were still at large. I'm sure glad you outwitted him this afternoon. Watch your step. Then he joined the young people at their table. George asked Nancy, what was the meaning of that announcement you made? In a low voice, the sleuth said, everybody look happy, not as if we're talking about anything important and I'll explain. Dave obligingly gave a broad grin. I'll collect our prize. 
He soon returned and began cutting and serving the watermelon. Meanwhile, the others listened, smiling and laughing, as Nancy told them that the Shadow Ranch cowboys were to act as decoys while the girls went to the cliff dwellings to search for the treasure. Shorty, no doubt, will alert Bercy and Diamond, and they'll be keeping an eye on the ranch. Sheriff Curtis praised Nancy for her plan and said he would follow the decoy group. I'll nab the varmints when they move against the cowboys. His blue eyes were sober as he said, I can see you're a capable gal, Miss Drew, but you got to be extra careful from now on, because those thieving hombres will want to keep you all tender feet quiet. We'll stay close to the girls, Dave promised, and the cowboys permitted no one to cut in during their dancing that followed. When the party was over, Jack said goodnight to Alice at the ranch wagon and promised to telephone her soon. As Nancy and her friends climbed into the car, Shorty came hurrying up to join them. Dave drove to the corrals behind the arena where Tex and Bud picked up the horses and trailer. Shorty got out too and walked into a phone booth at the edge of the parking area. He did not stay long. I'll bet he called Diamond and Bercy to tell them what I said, Nancy declared. As Dave started the drive home, Shorty questioned Nancy about her announcement. She laughed and replied that he would see later what she meant. Before he could ask any more questions, Bud struck a chord on his guitar and started a cowboy song. Shorty gave up talking and sat sullenly while the others sang all while the others sang all during the ride. Although she joined in the songs, Nancy's thoughts dwelled on the plan she had made for proving to Mrs. Thurmond that the phantom horse was a trick. She was pleased to note that the moon had gone behind heavy clouds and the night was very dark. When they reached the ranch, the cowboys hurried off to relieve Ed Raleigh and the foreman who had done guard duty during their absence. The girls went to the house where they found Mrs. Raleigh in the lighted living room. Chief lay by the fireplace. I felt safer with them in here, Aunt Bet explained. Nancy asked the others to accompany her to the kitchen. There they found Mrs. Thurman seated at the big table reading a magazine. I believe I can show you now how the phantom was made to appear, Nancy said. The cook looked skeptical and then exclaimed nervously as Nancy turned out the lights. With a mysterious smile, she slipped outside and hurried down the portico. Soon she returned. All set? Look through the screen door. Her friends complied and stared into the darkness. Suddenly, Mrs. Thurmond gave a scream and Mrs. Raleigh gasped. Bobbing toward them about three feet above the portico were tiny glowing specks. Oh, moaned the cook. Phantom spots! Take them away! Nancy opened the door and the shining specks floated into the room. End of chapter 17. I'm going to speed read one Nancy Drew book per day. Have fun. Thank you for the host, Bubbles. Shorty Rigdon. Steamy scene? I love a good cowboy song. Yeehaw! Watermelon. Nice pick. Nancy's fine, not going to lie. I'm gonna okay thank you for not twitching and driving a rocks be safe phantom spots oh uh a rocks um you are a hard worker and i know that even though you've had a hard day um like you said it's just one bad day it's not a bad uh definitely not a bad life and i i know that uh you know that and that I really hope things look uh, look up for you. I think with uh, your motivation to uh, in, with the business that you have started and the hard work that you put into that and the dedication that you have um, is uh, is commendable. And I uh, appreciate that um, from you as well as the generosity that you always show. I know I've complimented that before, but I think it, it deserves to be said again uh, that you uh, you're one of the most generous people in my chat, and I really appreciate that so much about. Uh, you so be safe driving home oh steamy meat that's, that's what I call it I have not played the untitled goose game <clears throat> I have not <laughs> on their Teslas until they crash all right three more chapters let's get it done get her done
Chapter 18, The Black Phantom. As the watchers stared amazed, the glowing speck stopped floating forward and hung in the darkness. Oh, Mrs. Thurman quavered, they shine just like the ghost horse. Nancy switched on the light. Before them stood Chief, a large rubber ball clutched in his jaws. Smiling at the flabbergasted onlookers, Nancy said, do you see how that phantom trick was, uh, was, was working? I do, George said promptly, phosphorescent paint on the dog's teeth. Where are the specks now? Mrs. Thurman asked as Chief dropped the ball. They don't show when the lights are on. At the time Chief disappeared after he chased the phantom horse, the spots were on his teeth. The young sleuth explained, I thought perhaps he'd bitten the ghost, but when I examined him in daylight, of course I found no evidence. The gang must have watched him, remarked Bess, but they never thought of his teeth, Nancy said, and fragments of the paint remain. How did you get on to this idea? Aunt Bet said. Nancy reminded the others of her suspicion that Chief had been muzzled and taken away because the gang feared there was a clue to the apparition on him. I learned in chemistry class that phosphorescent paint glows in the dark after first it has been exposed to light, she went on. I remembered that each time I'd seen the phantom horse there had been a light in the spring house just before. I put two and two together and decided that the apparition was a real horse. He was covered with a soft, thin material which had been coated with phosphorescent paint and exposed to light in the spring house by one of the gang members. Mrs. Thurman drew a deep breath and returned to Nancy. You're a downright marvel. That's what you are, young lady. Nancy blushed. You'll stay now, won't you? And the others all added their pleas. Of course I will, <clears throat> Mrs. Thurman declared stoutly. You just show me the varmint that's been doing this no good trick and I'll give him a piece of my mind. Before going to bed, Nancy told Aunt Bet and Uncle Ed of her plan for the following day. The rancher assured her that he would cooperate. At breakfast, the girls t talked lightheartedly of their all-day horseback ride. Where are you gals fixing to go? Shorty asked. We'll start up Shadow Mountain, Nancy replied vaguely. After that, we'll see. Mr. Raleigh broke into a point Texan butt as his helpers on the treasure expedition. <clears throat> When the meal was over, Nancy took Dave aside and told him that she, if she and the other girls found Valentine's hoard, they would light a fire on the lookout rock. Good, he replied. Then I'll drive down the valley in the truck and climb up to the cliff houses by the front steps to help you bring the treasure back to the ranch. Half an hour later, Uncle Ed, Tex, and Bud saddled up for their trip. Shorty hung around, eager to help as two pack horses were let out. One was loaded with digging tools and the other with supplies. "'What's that second animal for?' asked Sanders, who'd been told the secret. The rancher owner grinned for the treasure. <clears throat> the trio headed down the valley away from Tumbleweed. Shorty watched them for a minute, then hurried into the woods behind the ranch house. Strolling toward the stable, Nancy suspected that Bercy and Diamond were hiding among the trees, waiting to see which way the treasure party had gone. In the tack room, Dave helped Nancy pack a small digging tools into a saddlebag and roll a spade into a blanket. The cowboy then saddled the girls' horses and slung the gear aboard two of them. Mrs. Thurman brought lunches, which Dave added to a pack as Nancy called to her companions that everything was ready. Before they mounted, Nancy suggested that they cross the big meadow. We'll ride up Shadow Mountain from there. But it's in the opposite direction of the cliff dwellings, Alice whispered. That's the idea, Nancy replied, just in case Shorty suspects a trick and decides to follow us. Dave pulled out a stub of pencil and drew a map for Nancy on the back of an envelope. It showed a trail going east across the mountain to the cliff dwellings. Twenty minutes later, the girls were heading up Shadow Mountain. As they jogged along the trail, Nancy studied the map and noted that Dave's route was not began not far from the cabin. We can go there first, she said. If the gang is on a wild goose chase, now would be a good time to search for their hiding place. Though the girls were eager to go on with their real purpose, they spent the morning wandering over various trails. If anyone's following us, I hope he'll think we're just out for pleasure and give up on the chase, Nancy remarked. In early afternoon, they stopped beside a stream to eat their lunch, then rode straight for the cabin. After half an hour, however, they were brought up short by huge boulders on the path. A rock fall, George exclaimed. We'll have to detour. The riders backtracked, then crossed a steep, stony slope. Steep, stony slope. <laughs> so treacherous that they were forced to dismount and lead their horses slowly. Finally, they reached clear trail again. It was mid-afternoon when Alice cried out, There's the cabin! I see the roof! The foursome rode up the slope and ground hitched their horses. Cautiously, they made their way toward the cabin. The door was open and no one was inside. 
Nancy led the way behind the cabin and noticed again how close the back window was to the brush screen and rock wall. What a funny place to put a window, Bess remarked. Yes, that's one of the reasons I feel sure a hiding place is back here somewhere, Nancy replied. I think the window was used as an escape exit from the cabin. The girls examined the close-growing chaparral. A few feet to the side of the window, George discovered a break in the thorny brush. Nancy slipped into it, and one by one the girls struggled through and entered a narrow cleft in the rock wall. A few yards inside the opening, Nancy pointed out horseshoe, paw, and shoe prints. Let's follow the path the prints, she suggested. I have a hunch this path might lead to Valentine's hideout. The girls hurried to their mounts and soon were riding through a narrow pass with only a strip of blue sky visible above them. After a while, even that was blotted out by an overhang. The path grew gloomy and wound sharply around, around jagged outcrops. By the time the riders saw daylight again, the sun was low in the sky. They rode up a gentle slope and found themselves on a high plateau. Some distance ahead was a long, straight, rocky parapet about 12 feet high. Nancy reined up sharply. Look, she cried. Built against the wall was a three-sided stone enclosure with an old wooden gate. Inside pranced a handsome black stallion. The phantom horse, Nancy exclaimed. As the four riders approached, the animal whinnied and reared, backing toward a crude lean-to stable. Maybe the trick trappings are in there, George said. Nancy dismounted quickly, opened a wooden gate, and slipped into the enclosure. The black steed nickered nervously and shied away, but Nancy talked soothingly to him as she walked forward. There was a pile of hay in the corner of the stable. Nancy felt under it. In a few moments, her fingers encountered something soft, and she pulled out a bundle of white material. She carried it outside and closed the gate behind her. The phantom costume, Bess exclaimed as Nancy shook out the filmy cloth. It's Japan silk, a very thin material used for theatrical effects, Nancy told the girls. She tucked the cloth into her saddlebag. This stable looks old, Bess remarked. I don't think the gang built it. You're right, Alice exclaimed and pointed to a barely discernible heart scratched onto, onto the gate. Then Valentine's hideout must be near here, Nancy said. <clears throat> As the girls looked around, Nancy noticed a huge rock jutting from the far end of the parapet. With a thrill of excitement, she recognized the lookout point. We're on top of the cliff houses, she exclaimed. Let's get the wood ready for the fire, then start searching for the treasure. Beyond the lookout rock, the girls could see a grove of trees. They rode over and tethered their horses. The wind moaned through the fir trees and Nancy shivered. She took her sweater from the saddle horn and threw it over her shoulders. It was nearly dusk, so the girls hung flashlights on their belts. Then they collected wood for the signal fire and carried it to the lookout rock just as the sun set. Nancy was the last to make her way off the rock. To one side of it was a short flight of worn steps going down to the top row of cliff apartments. Nancy was about to lead the descent when they heard the howl of a coyote. She stopped short. What's the matter? asked Alice. Shh, listen. Everyone froze. I hope that's a real coyote, said Nancy. Bess gasped. You mean Shorty? If the gang has discovered our ruse, they may have backtracked and traced us here, George said. Nancy nodded. Don't turn our lights on. Hunging the parapet, the girls went down the steps to the narrow walk which ran in front of the apartments. To their left was a sheer drop-off. For a moment, they stood still, breathless at the height and the silence. Suddenly, there came a thump from the first room. Bess grabbed George's arm, and Alice gasped. Quietly, Nancy stepped to the open doorway and peered into the gloom. A man was lying on the floor. It's the end of chapter 18. <clears throat> Ghost dog. Hello, Hammer. Thank you for the host. Oh my god. I'm so sorry. Treasure party. Steal that horse. Hello, Data SKS. Yes, welcome to my reading stream. Don't think there is a book category. Schlissen. 
Is that what I said? Did I say schlissen? It's not often that someone says, I hope that's a real coyote. Who's the man on the flow? I suppose we'll have to keep reading to find out. We have two more chapters to go. Oh, it was a schlissen. It was a schlissen. I gotcha. Makes sense now. <clears throat> and thank you for that follow, Dada. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> All right. Chapter 19. The Cliff's Secret. Help, called a feeble voice as Nancy shone her flashlight into the dim room. Daddy, cried Alice and brushed past Nancy. She threw herself beside a thin, gray-haired man who was bound hand and foot. Uncle Ross, exclaimed Bess and George. The older girls swiftly untied his bonds. Crying for joy, Alice helped her father sit up and the two embraced. After introductions, Mr. Regger explained that he had made the thumping noise by kicking his heels. My throat was so parched I couldn't yell out to you. Then Alice's father told his story. I've been a prisoner in the cabin for six months, ever since they kidnapped me at the time of the bank robbery. But this morning, the gang intended to go after the Raleigh treasure party, so they moved me here where they thought I wouldn't be discovered. Why did you go to the bank the night of the robbery, Daddy? Alice asked. To get some important papers I had left there, I was working at home and needed them. He said he'd in he had interrupted the robbery and the gang took him along to keep him from identifying them. They're Westerners, he went on, and have used this cabin hideout before. The idea was to stay here for a cooling off period. How many are in the gang? Nancy asked. Three. At first, Shorty and Sid Bryce stayed in the cabin with me while Al Diamond lived in Tumbleweed and brought us supplies. Who's Sid Bryce, Uncle Ross? Bess asked. The gray-haired fellow who looks like me. He calls himself Bercy, Nancy told him. I know, said Mr. Regger. One day, Al Diamond came to the cabin all excited. He talked to an Indian girl named Mary Deer and learned all about Valentine's treasure. So Diamond decided that the gang should go after it and sent Shorty to get a job on the ranch. He was supposed to spread the Phantom Horse story and drive the Raleigh's off. Nancy looked troubled. Mr. Regger, what happened to the bank loot? <clears throat> It was hidden in the cabin until Shorty reported the two girls had spotted the place. The next day, Diamond and Bryce moved the money to the ghost town and made me go along. They had just finished hiding the loot in the old hotel when we heard your horses approaching. Bryce hustled me down the hill. All I could do was drop one of my crayons and hope somebody would find it. Oh, we did, Daddy! exclaimed Alice. <laughs> Mr. Regger said Diamond had remained in the ghost town to spy on the girls. <clears throat> Later, he told us he'd caused a rock slide. Nancy mentioned finding the coffee cups on the table in the cabin. Yes, we heard your horses clattering up the slope, so Bryce forced me out the window and back and into that little rocky passage. He had the dog on a rope and made him go too, but later he broke loose. We found one of your pictures on the table, Uncle Ross, said George. The man smiled. I have been drawing pictures to keep myself busy. Bryce has been selling them and keeping the money for himself, he added. Those terrible men! Have they mistreated you, Daddy? The bank president said he'd not been hurt, but had been underfed and was weak. I once heard Bryce say there was time enough to get rid of me when they left Shadow Mountain. While Alice told her father all that had happened so far, Nancy, Bess, and George flashed their lights about Mr. Rieger's prison. The floor was littered with pieces of broken pottery and rock. Beside the door, Nancy noticed a flat-topped boulder. The Indians probably used it for a table or a seat, she thought. Nearby was a large rectangular chunk of stone. The three girls switched off their lights and stepped outside. With Nancy in the lead, the three friends walked close to the wall of the cliff dwellings. They searched one apartment after another for the treasure, but always found the same thing. Shards and crumbled rocks. As the girls emerged from one of the middle rooms, Nancy noticed a crude wooden ladder resting against the wall and leading to the roof. It's just an old ladder, probably put there by the cliff dwellers, said Nancy. Said Bess. But Nancy did not agree. There are nails in this. Perhaps Valentine brought it here. I'd like to climb up. Let's finish searching the rooms, George said. Okay. As they neared the end of the row, the young sleuth exclaimed, Look! 
The last doorway was neatly blocked with an enormous stone. Valentine's hideout? exclaimed George. He must have put that rock there to keep intruders out. But how did he get in? Bess asked, puzzled. The stone's too big to be moved much on this little ledge. I know, exclaimed Nancy. Come on. She hastened back to that ladder. Swiftly, she attached her flashlight to her belt and slipped her arms into her sweater. By the time Bess and George caught up to Nancy, she would begun, began to clump. She had begun to climb breathlessly. They watched her as she cautiously tested each rung. One splintered before she finally reached the roof. Nancy, be careful! Bess cried fearfully. Shading her flashlight, Nancy moved toward the end chamber and found a column of ancient footholds to the plateau above. Probably there's another set like them on the other side, she reasoned. The latter was Valentine's extra escape route. Playing her flashlight over the surface, Nancy walked a dozen steps toward the end of the roof. Suddenly, she spotted a large hole. Shining her light into it, Nancy saw a pile of broken rock directly below. She gripped the sides of the opening and lowered herself into the chamber. Oh, it's musty in here. In one corner lay a moldering blanket and saddle. Nearby was a pickaxe. On the wall above these, Nancy found an indistinct carved letter. She brushed away the dust. V. For Valentine. Nancy's pulse pounded with joy and excitement. But where was the treasure? Well, it can't be buried, she thought. The floor is solid stone. When Nancy lifted the blanket, it fell into shreds at her touch. There was nothing beneath it. Her eyes fell upon a large pottery vase in the corner. The vessel was nearly three feet high and had a wide mouth. Nancy beamed her light into it. Standing on end and level with the top of the vase was a metal box. This might be it, Nancy exulted. She put down her flashlight, reached in, and lifted out the heavy box. It slipped from her grasp and hit the floor, jolting off a rusted padlock. Nancy pulled open the lid. <clears throat> Before her lay hundreds of small, shining gold hearts. Oh! Beneath the layer of gold pieces lay stacks of United States banknotes and a kamoi bag. It contained an assortment of precious jewels. This cannot be real, Nancy said aloud. I'm dreaming. But Nancy's mind clicked back to reality. I can't get this chest back through the ceiling, that's for sure. She eyed the pickaxe. Maybe I can pry the rock away from the door. Nancy worked the point of the pickaxe beneath the rock. She pulled hard. The slab moved a trifle. She tried again. This time the rock moved about a foot. Nancy pushed the treasure box through the opening, turned off her flashlight, and squeezed outside. George, Bess! The girls came running, and Nancy told her of her find. Take the treasure back to Alice and Mr. Regger, she directed. I'll light the signal fire. Cautiously, Nancy crawled out onto the jutting rock and took a packet of matches from her pocket. She struck one, shielding it from the wind, and held it to the kindling. As the smoke arose, a gruff voice behind her suddenly barked, Put out that fire! End of chapter 19. Six months, yeah. How do you keep a man for six months? I feel like this is a bad joke where the answer is something like, You marry him! And then a laugh track plays. Da -da -da. This time I decided to go into the rough. <clears throat> he couldn't be tied up for six months. He wouldn't still have all of his limbs. You think there was a break in six months of watching? Yeah. Valentine's is in 40 days. Your dad was born on Valentine's Day? That's neat. They can keep a man a prisoner for six months, but can't follow clues to a treasure in six months. Smokey the bear? So they're willing to try to get Nancy killed, but don't kill a guy held hostage for six months. <clears throat> we have one more chapter. It's the final chapter. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Rottas. What is going on with my light over here? Whoa, did you see that focus? Whoa. Focus. Oh, it didn't do. Okay. All right, here we go. Chapter 20, Daring Tactics. 
The voice was Al Diamond's. Nancy was trapped on the jutting rock far above the valley. Stamp out that blaze, the man repeated sharply, or I'll knock you off there. All right. Nancy's brain was in a whirl. She delayed until Diamond bellowed again, then she kicked the pile of smoldering wood from the rock. It burst into a shower of sparks and flame on the way down. Diamond snarled, Come here! When Nancy made her way back to the cliff, he said gloatingly, You think you're smart. As for those phony treasure hunters, we cut out of that trap when I spotted the sheriff trailing us. Nancy's spirits sank as Al continued to storm. You've made it too hot for us here, and you'll pay for it! He said the gang was on its way to the ghost town to pick up the bank loot when they stopped at the cabin. Shorty found fresh horse tracks and figured the girls had a line on the treasure. He saw you gathering wood and gave us his coyote signal. Nancy's captor bragged that he and his partners had hurried to the top of the steps and watched from above. Seeing the girls emerging from Regger's prison, the three men had sneaked down into one of the cliff dwelling rooms to spy on them. Finally, we saw you hurry by and then your friends showed up carrying something heavy. I said to myself, there goes the treasure. How nice to have Nancy Drew do all the work for us. You didn't harm Bess and George, Nancy said hotly. Oh, no, came the sarcastic reply. My boys let him get to Rager's prison, and then they closed them all in. Nancy fumbled for her flashlight and switched it on. Turn that off. I don't want anybody getting nosy. Hurry up. Get going. Nancy hoped desperately that Dave had seen the signal fire. In order to give him time to make the treacherous ascent, Nancy hugged the wall and moved as slowly as possible. Step on it, Diamond barked. Finally, he pushed her into the prison room. In one corner, she saw the red glow of a flashlight shaded by a cloth and near it the dark figures of two men. But she could see nothing else in the room. We're okay, Nancy, said came George's voice. They made us sit on the floor. And smashed our flashlights, said Bess. Diamond spoke up sharply. Shorty, where's the treasure? Can't see it, boss. You told me to keep the light covered. Diamond fumbled about before giving an exclamation of disgust. Rigor, are you hiding it? Let my father alone, Alice cried out. He doesn't have anything. Instantly, Nancy's foot reached for the large chunk of stone she'd seen near the door. Quickly, she shrugged her sweater from her shoulders and it dropped over the stone. All right, Mr. Diamond, here it is. As she spoke, Nancy stooped and gathered the rock into her sweater. I'll take it. No, you won't. With a mighty lunge, Nancy hurled the stone through the door and over the side of the cliff. Seconds later, it crashed on the rocks below. For a moment, there was a stunned silence. Then Diamond exploded. You've played your last trick on me, Nancy Drew. Bryce, Shorty, tie him up. Nancy sat on the stone bench beside the door and waited coolly while Shorty lashed her ankles together. <clears throat> Jo Diamond said, Bryce, you and I will go down to the valley and find the treasure. Shorty, guard these girls till you get my signal. At this, Nancy chuckled. Poor Shorty. By the time you reach the valley, your pals and the treasure will be gone. The cowboy stopped his tying and turned to Diamond. Let Bryce stay. I'm through sticking my neck out. Yes, Nancy declared. Suspicion was on you from the beginning. You wrecked the pump and cut the telephone wire. All right, Shorty said resentfully. And I put the generator out of whack and pulled the nettle trick. Shut up, Diamond ordered. George spoke up. They kept you busy, Shorty. After you imitated poor Chief, you found the clue in Nancy's watch and later stole the green liniment bottle. Out of the darkness came Bess's voice. Who ransacked our room? Bryce, rep replied Shorty. And that's about all he did. Is that so? Diamond sputtered angrily. Without my brains, you'd both be nowhere. What do you mean? Bryce interrupted. I cut the fences and knocked down the windmill. Now the men's voices shrilled in anger as each claimed importance for his part in the conspiracy. Diamond's voice rose with fury. Listen, he raged. I got the idea for the phantom horse. I bought the silk and paint and trained the stallion to come to my whistle. We helped you, Shorty retorted. He reminded Diamond that he and Bryce had put the trappings on the stallion for the phantom performance. Ross Rieger cut in. You almost caught them at it one night, Nancy. It scared them so badly they called off the phantom. I heard Bryce say he had to slip from the swing house into the cellar through the secret opening. Quit wasting time, Diamond shrieked. We've got to clear out of here. Now take it easy, Diamond, Shorty said with a ring of authority. 
It's me and Bryce against you. We'll go for the treasure. You stay here. Diamond fumed. Okay. But don't try any funny business and come right back. Without a word, the other two men went out the door, taking the light with them. The captives heard Diamond make his way through the darkness to the back of the chamber, then heard the creak of a hinge. A soft laugh came from the gang leader. In case you're wondering, I'm opening a wooden box where we keep dynamite and fuses. Gasps came from the prisoners. You can't do that, George cried out. I'm forced to. Ross Rieger knows too much, and I can't afford to let him go. Too bad, Nancy Drew, that you butted into my affairs. I'll stay, Mr. Rieger cried out, but don't harm these girls. No, and as soon as I light the fuse, I'll lamb out of here. Crack! A match flared in Diamond's hand. Wait, Nancy exclaimed. You'll blow up the treasure. The match hovered in midair. What? That was just a big stone I threw over the cliff. Nancy admitted. She turned on her flashlight and swept it about the room, making certain the beam hit the entrance several times. Someone just might notice it. Here, give me that! Diamond snatched the light. Now where's the thing you girls carry? Here, said Bess. We're sitting on it. Diamond pushed her and George aside and flipped open the chest. Good night! He grabbed a handful of the gold hearts and let them run through his fingers. Then he closed the lid and began to carry the box toward the entrance. Just then, the rattle of falling stones came from below. Flushed with success, Diamond called out, Shorty, Bryce, I have the treasure! Fellows, we're rich! Voices. Then a light flashed into the room. Hold it, Diamond! Dave! Nancy cried out. Di Diamond made a break for freedom, but George put out her foot and the criminal fell into the strong arms of Sheriff Curtis. Handcl handcuffs clicked shut. The girls and Mr. Rager gave shouts of joy at the sight of Dave, the sheriff, his deputy, and Mr. Raleigh. As the captives were untied, Ross Rigger told how cleverly Nancy had played for time. Dave smiled. She's the smartest little tenderfoot I ever saw. Then he related how the decoys and the sheriff's party had lost the gang and gone back to Shadow Ranch. When we saw the fire fallen, I figured something like this had happened. Mr. Raleigh added, we didn't want to give ourselves away, so we drove up the valley with our lights off. Dave added that Bryce and Shorty had been caught on the way down. But where's the treasure? Here, George grinned. Half an hour later, the party reached the valley floor just as the moon rose. Dave put Valentine's fortune in the ranch wagon while Nancy gave Sheriff Curtis a brief report. It was agreed that he would recover the stolen bank money from the Ghost Town Hotel in the morning, and the cowboys were to bring in the girls' horses and the phantom. The sullen prisoners were driven off in the sheriff's car. As Dave headed the ranch wagon down the valley, he said he thought Nancy should have a share of the treasure. I know the gold must be turned over to the state, Dave added, but the jewels and the banknotes should be worth a good sum. Nancy, since you found them, I feel the share rightfully belongs to you. The young detective smiled, then graciously but firmly declined to accept any part of the find. It was fun, she said. The grateful cowboy grinned. My brother and sister sure will be excited by the news. A little later, they turned into the gate. The ranch, bathed in silvery moonlight, looked peaceful. Alice squeezed her father's hand. Everything has turned out happily. Thanks to Nancy Drew, Mr. Rager smiled. What are you going to do now, Nancy, without a mystery to solve? Bess teased. Her friend smiled. Work on the sweater I'm knitting for Dad. She did not know then that soon she would become involved in the secret of Redgate Farm. But George knew that Nancy and mystery were never far apart. She gave a sigh of mock sadness. I hope your dad doesn't need that sweater very soon. End of chapter 20. And end of, ch and end of book. <clears throat> I thought you said, what's going on with my leg over there instead of light? Time up. Diamond exploded? It would take quite the pressure for that. Listen! There appears to be some discourse among these men. <laughs> so true. All right. Thank you for the claps. Thank you all for listening. My nose got really itchy in that like last, like for some, sometimes when I read at night, I've noticed it's more so when I read in the evenings than it is in the mornings. But like my nose gets really itchy the longer I read and I don't know why that is. <laughs> 
so who's the ghost horse that was the horse that they found a couple chapters ago um that was like scared of them and they found the silk that they had covered the horse with to make them glow in the day but oh excuse my yawn again all right guys that's gonna pretty much be the end of stream for me uh the next book that i will read will be a series of unfortunate events the end which is book number 13 of a series of unfortunate events it's the last one we have to read of this series so this will be the next book that we tackle i hope to be starting it next week but i'll let you guys know about that um i know it's pretty much the only thing anybody ever asks me for on my youtube channel so i want to get it out there pretty soon um so we'll start that um next week i think i don't want it to end i'm so sorry um i am not streaming tomorrow not streaming sunday i might stream on monday um i haven't even looked at ne my next week to be honest but um i have to get with a few people about plans and things and then i'll be able to kind of plan streams for next week so i might see you on monday morning um if not i'll see you soon uh, at the very latest i know i'll see you wednesday for best wednesday me and holland are, are finally going to be starting midnight in salem so i hope you guys enjoy that i don't think i'm allergic to nancy drew books it happens no matter what i tend to be reading in the evenings ended with a little did she know or was it a little did she knows <laughs> you're welcome for the stream i hope you guys all have a lovely night i'll see you all soon take care of yourselves much love and bye